quiet on the set. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Welcome to the Albion Seed Study Group, where we are working through David Hackett Fisher's book, Albion Seed for British Folkways in America. I noticed when I reviewed last session's um, recording that I kept calling him Professor Hackett. I don't know why I did that, but he is definitely um, a professor at Brandeis University and has been serving in that position for over 50 years. All right, we don't have our cousin Russ. It's, um, I'm going to ask Melissa if you would please watch the list of attendees for somebody emulating Cousin Russ <laughs> by any <laughs> of the name. And uh, then you, uh, I can elevate him uh, so that he can be co-host. What a time we're having today. It, that means we're going to have a good session, folks, a good session. Okay, so in the book, uh, as we had talked about last time, um, the author references William Gray or Graham Sumner, who says that folkways are habitual usages, manners, customs, mores, and morals, and they're pretty much etched in stone. And uh, this kind of goes along with the premise of, of Professor Fishers. He says folkways are highly persistent but never static. So there is a possibility for change. But then through the majority of his book, what he does is say, okay, the people that were from this area in England set up their government that way and they built houses the same way they did in the old country, et cetera. And along that line um, uh, is the basis for each of the four migration groups that uh, uh, Professor Fisher discusses. Okay. Uh, so of the many folkways that come up in the book, the ones that have the little asterisk by it or the stars we say, okay, we've got some heavy breathing going on there. Um, the ones with the stars are the ones I'm tending to focus on. This book is so rich with comparisons. It's filled with uh, footnote, sometimes taking up more than half a page, where he will go into details about how, uh, you know, up, up above he will have said this is his premise and down below he'll give you references to several others who have disputed that um, uh, preference or description of a folkway, a, a custom that's been carried over from the old country. And I can't just keep there's so much to talk about. I could talk for an hour just on this chapter and not violate copyright uh, because there's so much information available there. So I do encourage you to get the book. It's only about 11 or $12, even though it's a 900 page paperback book. Okay, this week we're going to talk about the South of England to Virginia uh, folks, that migration pattern involved distressed cavaliers and indentured servants, and their migration started to occur about the time that Puritan migration was concluding, the one we d discussed in our last session. Uh, this was from 1642 to about 1675. And as you can tell from that photo or that etching, these folks were royalists and they dressed royally and they were typically i think the men outweighed the women four to one in the migration from england and these were typically the a younger son of uh more than landed gentry those who were associated with royalty and uh anybody know why they were distressed See if we can see some comments from the community. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Chris is asking, is there, are they lost the war to Cromwell, primogenitra, um, which Linda brought up um, 
the primogenitor is where the oldest son inherits the property. So what are the younger sons going to do? They can't have the property. They're not going to divide it up. That oldest son gets it, period, upon the death of the father. Um, Peggy uh, is telling us, and I'm sorry, I can't bring the comments in. We're just having a technical snafu. Peggy's saying second sons had a choice of um, uh, being in the military, being a school teacher, or becoming, a, a, you know, a parish priest, or emigrating. Now, I've given you two reference works here, both by Peter Coldham. They're well known. These books were around since, I, I don't even know their publication date, but they've been around since I started doing serious research on my Maryland, Virginia people. They were um, descendants of original Quaker immigrants. We'll discuss them next time. Um, and so mine were more, mine were an exception. But these two books, when they say the complete book of immigrants, it's the, the Cavaliers, the upper crust people, those second and third sons that came over. And uh, when they're talking about emigrants in bondage, they're not talking about African-American slaves. They're talking about, um, in this book of David Hackett Fisher's and in uh, Coldham's book, they're talking about not the lowest class in England, but the lower class, not the lowest, but just up a bit from that, mostly agrarian, not educated, only about 30% were artisans who had any type of a trade compared to 60%, according to um, uh, Professor Fisher for the um, Puritan migration. Um, so, and indentured servitude is a way that many Englanders got to the New World. Um, Melissa, do you have any of those in this migration group? Um, actually, no, I don't. Okay. Um, yours, are the mine. Back, yours are the backwoods people from the borderlands? <laughs> uh, no, uh, my maiden name, they came from France. Oh, okay. So, from uh, Alsace-Lorraine, France. Um, they came in the 1600s to Maryland. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but then the other, my other surnames came later, much later. All right. So we do recognize, folks, that there are other migration patterns than these. Mm -hmm. And we just had to pick these four. That's part of what this uh, group or what this book is about. So though your people may not be part of these migration groups that we're studying, when you think about, as, as Melissa does, about her uh, Alsatian ancestors from along that Rhine River area um, in France, bordering on what we think of as Germany now, she's going to look for these same um, um, uh, cultural um, and religious uh, folkways, attitudes towards marriage, and be curious about them because she will have studied with us uh, what these are for these four migration patterns. Okay. Peggy has a comment, if you can hear me. Okay. What's Peggy tell us? Peggy I can says, hear you. When they indentured themselves, they were referred to as free will willers. Uh, those who came with no choice were oftentimes uh, convicts and other undesirables. Yes, and when we're talking about these early, this early migration, um, the undesirables were came slightly later. These were remember I said they didn't come from the very lowest class, according to the professor here. Um, but uh, there is, but I'm glad you made that distinction, Peggy, because you're absolutely right. There's several ways that a person could decide to get from England to the Americas. Now, the Cavaliers were distressed because, oh, they'd lost the Cromwellian War. They had fought for uh, Charles I. Um, Parliament actually disbanded their military units. And um, they needed to get out of Dodge, <laughs> to use a very Western phrase. The uh, 
they had wealth and they wanted to recreate the large homes, et cetera, from which they had come uh, in their father's households, but did not inherit because they weren't the first son. Now, where the heck are all my notes? So I'm gonna have to do this off the top of my head. <laughs> okay, folks, unlike most of Dear Myrtle's study groups, I gotta kind of lecture a little bit, but I really appreciate your, foot, uh, your input here. So to indenture oneself, as the servants would need to do, uh, they would enter into an agreement that in exchange for their passage on the ship, room and board, that they would indenture themselves to the master. And that could, that's one of the cavaliers. Uh, in, in a couple of instances, there were businessmen who had rent an entire boat and, um, uh, pay for the passage and then he would sell that indentured servant to one of the cavaliers who needed more servants uh, on his plantation or in his household. Peggy um, has and, another comment. Good. Thanks, Russ. Uh, this was also around the time that the plantation of Ulster was going on and the Virginia plantation would come right afterwards. And I have an, an ancestor, my sixth, seventh great grandfather, was an indentured servant. Mm -hmm. Now, and I I need to get to Annapolis, and I may have to talk to Mr. Turner because he's down there. But uh, there's got to be a record that I know what the story says, uh, but I got to find. There's got to be a record down there, and I believe that. Uh, Carol Petranik told me there was one, but I need to get down there and see it to see what it really says. Yeah, so this these, chapter is awesome. Yeah, this chapter is right up your alley, as is the next one on Quakers, uh, Cousin Russ. So these um, large parchment agreements or um, indentured agreements um, are loose papers at um, at the, at the Maryland State Archives, uh, Annapolis Hall of Records. And they're not all available online. This is another one of those cases where you gotta go there in person like Cousin Russ is talking about. All right, so um, the other thing to tell you is that a typical indentured time period would be f uh, for like seven years. And you could, as an indentured servant, um, you were promised room and board and, and clothing. And uh, some of the Cavaliers were nicer than others, let's put it that way. Most were pretty strict. And if you were lazy or you ran away and were caught, something like that, and we're, again, we're not talking slaves, we're talking indentured servants. That, in, that indenture could be extended beyond the seven years. And if I've, I've read of instances where uh, if you came over with your mom or your older brother and sister and you were in this lower class indentured servant category and let's say your mom passes away, then that child might have to also serve out the indenture for the mother, even though the mother dies halfway across and so only incurred half the expense uh, to whomever it was uh, that he had sworn out as indenture. Peggy has another piece of this discussion. Indenture Super. comes from the word denture, which means to cut. The large piece of paper was cut uh, with a district edge, distinct edge, and the top half had to match the bottom half when the end of the indenture ship came. So one went to the servant and one went to the master or the owner of the of the paperwork. All right, so, um, <laughs> yeah, all right, we need to change her to all panelists and attendees so that, all right, so what have we got here? This is Stratford, uh, the Lees Mansion in Virginia, and it's quite grand. You've got a center area typically is, um, let's see, I think it was 45 by 48 feet. And then each of those wings are 25 feet, 
gosh, some of us have houses that are like 25 feet and that's it, you know, 25 by 30 maybe. These were huge mansions. They were actually nothing compared to the family estates back home uh, where these men had grown up. Um, notice that four fireplaces share common, uh, well, they, they bound up the chimneys. So a total of eight fireplaces. Um, and I would dare say that a chimney on the, that the chimney goes not only to that upper floor, but to a fireplace on the lower floor since they didn't have central heat and air conditioning. Let's compare and contrast that with the migration pattern we talked about last time where we had the, um, the uh, house in Guilford, Connecticut, where it was made typically out of clapboard. Um, the front of the house would have been what we're seeing in the left side as the back of the house. Um, and the tradition, the traditional response for why do we have this great big long, um, uh, um, uh, line for the uh, roof. So that would be roof line. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> the roof line on that side of the house, and it harkened back to the days back in England where houses were all squished up together like townhouses, and the front of them, uh, the roof came way down, so as if it were to look like a one story home with just a big roof. When in fact, in the backside, which the taxpayer or tax man could not see, had the second or uh, third story um, available. But being all squished together, that wasn't something you could see. So it was a t an attempt to evade taxes, um, circumvent heavy taxes. So we got two completely different styles and they correlate strongly with the type of buildings that these folks came from back in their areas uh, of origin, their ancestral homelands in England. All right, now a typical plantation and the, and the layout of like if you were to look at a whole county's worth of things are very different in Virginia than they were up in New England. The concept was it'd be really super cool if you had a thousand acres of land and you plopped your huge mansion in the middle of it so that nobody could see you. Those little stars are, are woods. Sorry, that's the best I could do. Um, and fields, that could be like a 40 acre field, each of those fields um, near the plantation home. Um, and I made a little green inset to show you, you could have three plantations that are quite separate. You did not want to see your neighbor. Um, and then the little dot here in the green inset represents that little tavern that's typically at a crossroads. Challenging, uh, but that was, that was the plan. Back in England, what these folks were accustomed to in the uh, south and west part of England typically, were a lot of woodsy areas. Uh, if there are any open areas, these were, um, how did they put it? Um, they were like parks and things for the gentry, for the upper class to enjoy, the, the royalty, the uh, people of the court. And so having set your home way back away from civilization and very far from your neighbor was the goal in Virginia. Very, very different from what we saw in New England. Now in New England, remember we'd have the town square and Dave Robeson reminded us that the town square or very close to it, you'd have to have room to practice marching the militia would have to practice marching, but all of the little homes and even the church would be on this town square and the road would come to and from and all of the property would extend out behind. So people wanted to live close together. And as Dave pointed out, it was security because uh, you could easily block up the roads um, for defenses and between the homes, et cetera. So you had a nice little tight enclave. And so this pattern um, of, of setting up a plantation more closely aligned with the uh, 
with the style of homes and the layout on the land that these distressed cavaliers enjoyed when they were in their father's household on their ancestral lands in England. Okay, dokey. So now I did um, permit myself to take a page or two from the book itself. This is, excuse me, page 238 from the book. I'll be in seed. And so on the left side, you're seeing the origins of Virginia's elite, those distressed cavaliers, um, and see how heavily it goes toward the south part of England, the darker gray. Um, and then when it comes to the naming of the places in Virginia, the names are very similar to their home towns. Uh, familiar names. And we saw that, uh, although I didn't discuss it much last time when we talked about the Puritan migration. That's why um, when you say they're from Berkshire or Berkshire, as people say, um, you got to know, are we talking England? Are we talking New England? Uh, are we talking Virginia? You got to know more than just that town name. All right. Didn't uh, Dave say last week that in the town in your drawing that mm -hmm. the churches were around the outside of that center square? Well, um, I remember me saying that in Connecticut, the churches had to be on the town square and you had to belong to one of them in order to vote for a great number of decades. Right. I wanted so, to compare and contrast that with with what we're talking about in Maryland or more specifically in Annapolis, because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. The church in Annapolis was in the center square. It was the center circle in the town of Annapolis because the Anglican church in Annapolis is St. Anne's Anglican church in Annapolis and it is in the circle in the center of the town. Okay. Now, what we're seeing in Virginia is a church somewhere out along the road. Um, the town itself could have a church in a small market area, but I'm thinking of my Paul Froman's church that he attended. And remember, he died over in Kentucky in 1783, but he was, but up there in the Shenandoah Valley, you have to go along a little circuitous route and then suddenly you turn a corner and there's this church on the hill. But it's I not think part we, of the town. I think there is a difference though. In, in, and I was very specifically when I sent Anglican because that's oh, yeah. what the church was there as opposed to your ancestors may not have been Anglican. And so the church position might have been different. Yeah. The, um, the Anglican church was, in fact, in this early migration, um, the church. In fact, the, the um, colonial government passed, I think it was 17 laws that basically ousted the Quakers and others um, who were not Anglican. And there were only two small communities of Quakers who survived uh, that oustering during this time period that we're discussing. It's, it's a challenge because we're, there are multiple migrations where folks from England are setting up their Anglican churches. So we're just going to talk about this earlier one at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know if Dave, Dave, or, can you talk and bring in your own comment? Okay, I can turn on Dave's comment or bring him up. But he's over to here. Oh, are you, Dave? You want to unmute yourself? He's unmuted. I'll read in his comment. You, in line there you. he is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. You And you mentioned churches being on uh, outside of the village or whatever. They're generally on the town square. Of, yeah. And I mentioned Karen's Congregationalist Church is the first church in Ludlow is the name of the church and was established in 1774. It's across the street from the geographic center of the village, of the original village. There's a post there and directly right. across the street is the church. I was just in Brimfield, my uh, DNA class tonight in Brimfield, Mass. And the school that I was in uh, was 
on one side of the town square in the in their large congregational church is on the end of the town square so they and that's that's pretty common all the yeah. towns around here uh at least in western mass and and all over massachusetts uh these ancient uh Puritan or Congregationalist churches were either in or you know on the town square or adjacent to the town square. And again, it goes back to building that fence, the palisade around the village. Um, mm -hmm. In that map you have on the left hand side, I don't want to take up too much time, but they they could easily build a palisade around there for defense. Yeah, we mentioned. Um, I yeah. think we mentioned that before you got here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, exactly. That's what you, that palisade concept um, was something I learned from you and did not read in this book by David Hackett Fisher. Okay, Russ, you want to bring in two comments? Yeah, Peggy says, uh, Reverend John Craig was brought in to Augusta Stone Church in the Shenandoah Valley. His, Shenandoah Valley, his records go back to 1740. They needed a minister. Okay, and, uh, so Stephan that the group we're talking about is, is 100 years earlier, but even, at the time period you're talking about, um, Peggy, they're still having trouble getting ministers. So they're still having to send back to England to get somebody over here to help. Interesting. Stephanie has a, has a comment. One of my best friends from college currently own uh, Presqua Island in Culpeper County, Virginia. They are trying to rebuild and preserve the history, especially the history of the enslaved persons. So if anyone has any ancestors in the area, be sure to look them up. And Betty Lou has a comment. Also, the location of the church would be uh, one of the folkways. The Cavaliers would be used to travel to church and also would have the means to travel whereas in other areas the people were not as well to do and tend yes. to live and walk to church that is that is a very smart comment there betty lou thank you um because these folks that were the distressed cavaliers they're used to running around in carriages horse-drawn carriages elegant carriages and as opposed to people that just needed to walk across from their home to the ch appropriate church in the town square. Okay, so Peggy shall says we move after, on? Oh. Uh, Peggy, there's a couple more. Peggy says after Jamestown and the Tidewater areas were settled, it would be 125 years before they moved much further inward. I um, th believe that's inland. Yeah. Uh, Chris okay. says the map on the left side looks a lot like many of the places in Kentucky where my ancestors st settled when they came from Virginia. Well, um, so that is an interesting thing. Who said that, Russ? That's kind of cool. Uh, Chris. All right, so Chris, um, as those, as this first, as the descendants of this first group uh, that came to Virginia, move farther inland or inward as Peggy says, yes, you're not suddenly gonna take up um, uh, the same architecture that's being used in New England. Frank Lloyd Wright hadn't been born yet, so we weren't just suddenly adopting something strangely new. You build what's comfortable. Now, um, we're not going into a lot of detail on the small shacks and things like that, that the um, indentured servants who are now freed, they're supposed to get um, a, a gun, a, a set of clothing and some land, hardly ever got the land. So they'd kind of have to go farther west where land had not been yet developed or settled. And that's, that's a continuation. They're going to try to, um, you build what feels comfortable. You build a house like what you grew up in um, or what you wish you'd grown up in. Um, but I digress. All right, so a couple things, a couple more slides here. Um, all righty. So we know a little bit about where these elite families came from. Look, in the, in the southern part, yep, there were some up in the northern part of England, but the majority of them came from these more well-to-do areas. Um, 
In fact, it's interesting, some of these men, remember I said they outweighed the women four to one, and they were the younger sons. They had already traveled to London and set up businesses. They uh, bought and sold um, fabric and things along that line. So they, were, they became merchants, but they wanted land. Hence this move to Virginia. All right. Um, some other things to tell you about these rascals. Okay, that's the origin of names. Um, let me uh, minimize this for a little bit and uh, talk to you some more. Now, I've got my cheat sheet here, the one I've been working off of for decades. Uh, the, this is the, the third or fourth time we've, I've worked through Albion Seed with a study group. They married for money. Money was a focus. There's a lot of intermarriages among these um, upper class people that have come from England. They marry each other, have family alliances, um, and they believe that love follows marriage. And parents weighed in heavily on the choice of your marriage partner. And there's a practice of marrying your first cousin. Um, not the backwoodsy kind of marrying your first cousin, but for those political and power alliances and business alliances. It was a patriarchal system. The women were to obey. Now I know why Mr. Mert kept his townhouse in Virginia before we got married. <laughs> I would have to obey him. How's that going for you, Mr. Mert? Um, okay. They tended to do a thing, um, and, and Bell Greenwood talks about that in the Researcher's Guide to American Genealogy, uh, calling everyone your cousin. Even they might be a close friend. Well, some of them actually were your distant cousins because of family, you know, the Randolphs married into the Lee family and the Blairs were part of the mix. Um, and so, um, but, but they called each other cousin. Um, they had a royal council with 12 people on it. Um, they, they believed, this was interesting, uh, up in the Anglican or up in uh, the Puritan area, they were dealing with trying to religiously pro perfect themselves as individuals to come into compliance with God's laws. But although that was sort of something they talked about at church in, uh, here in Virginia in this early time period, what we see more is that their responsibility is to bring others unto Christ and unto God. And that would be particularly these indentured servants, these underlings, you know, because we are smarter than these underlings. What an attitude to have. Um, yeah, they were obsessed with fortunes and gathering fortunes and that affected um, their uh, marriage uh, decisions. And education was also influenced by that elitist attitude of these uh, cavaliers. They did not want their indentured servants to be educated. They did not want these lower classes to be educated. They didn't want the girls to be educated per se because they were to obey their husbands. Um, so they did not do what was done in that uh, first migration pattern we discussed up in New England, there, where there was um, compulsory public education. They, the people in Virginia, these cavaliers feared, literally feared, according to the author, uh, education of the general population. This would be reserved for their sons and send them back to England, have them graduate from Oxford, et cetera. Um, all right, let me talk to you about uh, horse racing and waging. Games of chance were very popular. They're, they had a more, um, well, a very liberal attitude toward um, sexual relations and a hi much higher incidence of uh, premarital sex and uh, unwed mothers. 
Uh, let's see. Um, recruited, oh, male dominated. It, up in New England, we saw more the elderly, the one gentleman in the community that was revered because of his age and status. Uh, but here in Virginia, we definitely see a class structure of these cavaliers. I'm going to say the uppity cavaliers. No offense to your ancestors if they're in this. And the lowly indentured servants and those who late, later worked off their in, indentured servitude. Um, okay, let me, what happened to my map of, uh, oh yeah, I want to show you a few websites here. All right. So if you were just to look at this picture of Richard Lee the first, kind of looks kingly, doesn't he? Doesn't look like a guy that rolled up his sleeves and dug in and did some work like the rest of us do. Um, last time we talked about how the uh, clothing style of those Puritans was very plain and simple and unadorned. Um, it would be uh, linen, none of the velvets and velveteens and, and fancy flounces and things like that that we see as common dress uh, in, among the Virginia Cavaliers. All right, and we also notice that um, family crests were a big deal because it would tie you back to your family in England. You would have this uh, emblazoned on the wall or in a fresco above your doorway of your mansion in the middle of your thousand plus acre plantation um, because this was your claim to fame, I guess is the way to put it. Okay, now William Berkeley was the governor. Here's another one of those. We saw this picture before in my PowerPoint. Look at all those curls. I'm imagining that's a wig. I think, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, even the, the stance and the profile uh, in this etching shows, yes, it says it's a wig. Um, He's, he's acting very much in a grand manner. Berkeley County, Virginia, now West Virginia. Uh, he was probably bald, Dave says. I love it. Okay, uh, let's see if there's, oh, there's his signature. Um, I once read his diary. He's <laughs> and one thing that struck me, and apparently it was, it's a very X-rated diary. <laughs> just like I wanted to read the Harry Potter, Potter books to see what was up. I read Berkeley's uh, diary. And for like six weeks straight, morning, noon, and night, he ate pears, poached pears. No wonder he got sick. But it is true that the upper crust, the rich planters in this migration pattern would, would eat fruits and vegetables all year long. Um, they didn't eat lowly things like potatoes until those became popular among their uh, wealthy uh, family members back in England. Whereas the poor typically had a one dish meal that would, it, be a lot of corn, which the upper crust people would consider just feed for cattle. Um, uh, poor people, these indentured folks would um, eat greens and salted meat, hominy, which is a, a you um, make hominy out of corn kernels that you've soaked in lye. Of course, you wash that all off, of course. My dad liked hominy with a little butter on it. Um, yeah. Um, so what are you thinking about this migration pattern in relationship to what we've studied thus far? Uh, do you have folks that are in this category? Now we know Melissa doesn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, Russ. Yeah, I, I do because Captain John is part of that and other members of his family. There's a house not too far from where he lived uh, that was the uh, home of Francis Scott Key. And on his door in the house 
and I believe it's still today, mm -hmm. is one of those family crests. Mm -hmm. uh, th that family crest for uh, Captain John's family is all over the place. Uh, and I have about five different versions of it, but you can find it in Annapolis where he lived and his plantation, Captain John's plantation, is right across the street from Annapolis because I've been there and the plantation. Right, let, let me pull it up. Let me just search for it. See if I can do Captain John's plantation. No, you want uh, Pendennis Point, Maryland, which is an interesting word. P-E-N-D. Pendennis, yes. Pendennis Point. P-N-D-E-N. I-S Point. Now, I bring, it, I bring that up because in your map, <clears throat> uh, there. Uh, this is in Cornwall. Well, that's exactly why I wanted you to do this. <laughs> okay. Because there is a Pendennis Point in the over, lower left-hand corner of your map of England. Mm-hmm. So my question is, why is Pendennis Point across the river, the Severn River from Annapolis, which is what Captain John's plantation was on and Pendennis Point is there today? All right, let me do at plus Annapolis. Um, all right, uh, visit Cornwall, here it is. Oh, it's a drive. Go ahead, go ahead. That's that's an advertisement for a house, but that that will take you to where I'm talking about the on the map. Point. Mm -hmm. It's right on a. You, it's right across that river, right there. And there's Annapolis. Pen, mm -hmm. Yep, that's Pendennis Point, right right about where your mouse is. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a, a military. Uh, war memorial right there, but it's if you stand at the war memorial, you're looking at Pendennis Point. But that's right there is Captain John's plantation. So, uh, and then when I did some research on it, I ended up with this castle in England. <laughs> My question is, why? <laughs> yep, it sounds like uh, a migration pattern, and they use some of the same names. I but mean, if you're going to name places, wouldn't you want to use familiar names that bring back good memories? Well, I, I and, and I got, I absolutely get that. But mm -hmm. he was 14 when he came, mm -hmm. and it's far, it's too far away from where he came from in theory in England, mm -hmm. because uh, Pendennis is in the in the west southwest corner of of England. And he was in Manchester, which is far inland from there. Well, certainly, so, certainly, we have exceptions. And when we looked at the map, there were people from in this migration pattern that were even high up north in England. So there are exceptional people, and of course, it'd be your people, cousin Russ, that are exceptional. Uh, but the bulk of them came from the south of England. So anyway, the, only, right. the, the hint that I have for that, though, is that he may have come through there on his journey from the old country to the new country. That's interesting. Uh, um, uh, yeah, where did the where did that name come from? Because uh, when I made the connection between England and here, and understanding what we're going through this discussion. Uh, I, I was trying to make the the connection. The only connection I can make uh, for this young kid mm -hmm. is that the, somewhere the journey f from him to come to the colonies was through Pendennis or a, a port near that area. Or it's something he heard of and he wanted to emulate it. Yeah, um, the individual journeys um, are some, there are a few that are outlined, a few examples. Uh, in Dr. Um, uh, in, uh, I was going to say Dr. Jones, <laughs> which which hangout are we in right now, Russ? Uh, in uh, Professor Fisher's book, Albion Seed. Um, and that is our challenge as genealogists to compare and contrast a migration pattern for the time period our people arrived um, at, with what could have been the personal experience for our ancestor. 
there's something else I want to talk with you all about, and that's the impact of the Chesapeake Bay and all the rivers that feed into it. Now, of course, this is a modern Google map, and I'm going to zoom in. And you mentioned the Severn River, there's Potomac River, uh, Chesapeake Bay, the Rappahannock River, etc. Um, it was especially, there's the York. Um, it was especially advantageous for a plantation owner to uh, have a way to get his goods to market. And if he's living on, um, you know, 1,000 acres, up 20,000 acres it could be, part of his land needs to be on one of these navigable rivers so that he can have a dock and boats can come up or he can send a boat downriver to where the bigger ships, the bigger merchant ships, which he might, uh, you know, fill up one third of it, um, and his goods combined with others would go back to England. And remember, these were gentlemen who had, who had left their father's home in England, become merchants in London. So they knew the merchant trade. Uh, they um, raised goods here and sent them back to England. And on the return trip, the ship would bring China, crystal, silver, things that these upper crust Virginians, and they called them first families of Virginia, but they weren't the first arrivals in Virginia. We certainly know about Jamestown and, and others. But the, the, this particular migration pattern that we're looking at, who they were hungry for some good Stratfordshire China and silver and, and things along that line to that that be, were the accoutrements that would bring their large plantation homes more into the style to which they would like to become accustomed and had been accustomed to in their father's uh, estates back in England. So it was a constant back and forth. So the, the fact that it's on Chesapeake Bay also gives us something. Um, it's a very humid area. Any of us who've lived in Maryland or Virginia, Baltimore, um, you know, Norfolk, it's humid. Ellen says, I grew up in Patuxent in a Quaker village, and I believe she's talking about near Laurel, Maryland. If you would move up, a, I want to zoom out just a little bit because at the south end of that river, look across the river from, from it. Okay, which we want to, the Patuxent's up here by um, Baltimore, isn't it? Yeah, okay. yeah, I've, but yes, it is. But I was, I wanted, I believe the, the what I'm getting at is the relationship between the Patuxent River, or... Uh, Patapsco might not the be there Chesapeake yet. Chesapeake Bay and yeah. Jamestown, that's what I w wanted to get to, which would be downstream. Okay, so downstream, so the, the upper part of the Chesapeake reaches way up here by Elkton, which is yep. Maryland. Okay, then I'll zoom out. There's Baltimore, and here's Annapolis that we were talking about. Uh, we used to cut across there on our way to uh, Ocean City in the summer when I was a kid. Um, okay, there's the Potomac River coming out of Washington, yep. scrolling around. I forget what the, is this, a, what's this river? Can't remember. Pat there's your Patuxent River. Yep. All right. Uh, okay, I'll zoom out again. All of these riverways were very, there's the Rappahannock, the York, and you want Jamestown. There's Newport. So there's Williamsburg. So the, down toward what is right in that area is is it Williamstown? There it is. Yeah. So I, I'm just uh, what I recognized is the Howards, for an example, yes. were down in Jamestown and made it up the river to Annapolis. And uh, somebody said. Uh, uh, Joanne said uh, Sir Richard Ridgway did not have uh, 
the E in his name. He is my eighth great grandfather, and I have Ridgeways in my family. Okay, and Miss Peggy, I have Howards of Howard County, Maryland. So we are cousins. We are. That is cool. She says they're in her line. <laughs> this is incredible. All right. So, so the rivers played a big part. In fact, when you go to the northern neck of Virginia and you go to any of the um, county historical societies, they want to know which river did your ancestor live on? Right. That's how big a deal it is. It isn't, it's like when you go to look up military records. Okay, what unit was your guy in? Union or Confederate? Was it Maryland? Something, you know, what was it? So kind of fun. How's our time? We're doing well. All right. Yes, Betty Lou, the Ridgeway, that's a different uh, Ridgeway line is in Little Wake Harbor. That's another line, but there's Cyril Stum down in, uh, uh, down in Maryland. All right, so um, Melissa, tell me about your St. Mary's and Charles County, Maryland people. That's the Eastern Shore, isn't it? It is, okay. I think it's Western Shore, Charles and St. Mary's. It's down bottom Maryland. Okay, so um, let me, first of all, go all the way out. Here's Washington. So, oh, this part is the Western mm -hmm. Shore and St. Mary's is somewhere in here. And what's the town? Um, the the place where they lived is called Betty's Delight. I don't know if that's a plantation name. Yeah, it's an or... old name. That's a pl plantation name. Mm -hmm. And so they came from France. Uh, his name was Abraham, and today we pronounce it Lee Master, but back then it was spelled differently. And in, in in a French accent, I would say Lee Master or something like that, because it was spelled totally different. Lee Master. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, yes. And he came, he was, uh, he came here, they came here in the 1660s, I believe. So slightly, so like while this was happening, because this yes. one, the migration pattern we're discussing, and it's very distinct from later Cavaliers arriving. This one concluded around 1670. I mean, right. So they, were, they, were they were Huguenots. They were Huguenots. Yeah. Too. The Huguenot. Yeah. yeah Huguenots. Huguenots. Yep, there are different ways to pronounce that. Yes. And there are also those Huguenots who were up in uh, Kingston area up in New York. That's a different migration pattern. Um, it's so fun to figure all this stuff out. And from whence did they come? And who are the original immigrants, et cetera? Particularly in a colonial time period, folks, where we don't know, um, you know, the records may not be as strong as a very organized government. Um, for the very earliest settlers, like think of the Roanoke people, nothing left. All right, a couple uh, bits of housekeeping before we go. I just want to remind you, Cousin Russ, tell us why we have Dear Myrtle's genealogy community over on Google+. That's where the conversation will continue and I will put a link to that in the chat right now, if I can get my mouse where it needs to be. Yes. Uh, that's so, the, while you're watching and listening to us and see the, the chat going on and the chat log will be posted when it is uploaded and put on Dear Myrtle's uh, blog. But the conversation will continue to Dear Myrtle community. All you need to do is request to join and we check your profile, your Google Plus uh, profile and let you join. And if you have notifications turned on, you will be notified when somebody makes a comment or adds a new post and the, but the conversation continues we don't want it to stop all right cousin russ has given you the link to our syllabus material it's albion seed for british folkways in america um you're perfectly fine I'll with post the, it again oh thank you so much i think you've done an awesome job considering that you like having to do this with one hand tied behind your back and you can't see you um anyway um i i've opted for the paperback, that's all I've ever had. And um, yeah, you it's perfectly fine. I can't imagine listening to this on CD. It's just too detailed. You've got to put sticky notes in uh, and make marginal notations. All right, um, you'll want to check out the Genia webinars calendar. Um, 
and to see what's coming up next. Now, I always cross post things to both um, the Jenny webinars calendar and Dear Myrtle's calendar. Let me show you what I'm going to do. Uh, Dear Myrtle, i sorry I didn't have this up. This is my newer blog since last summer. I wanted to move over to um, the WordPress platform. This is what I did for the study group this morning for America Gen study group. Um, I embed or I give you um, the graphic that concerns that study group. The link to the syllabus material is, as Russ is giving it to you for this study group. Where to register for the future sessions. And um, in the, this morning we had homework. Tonight you didn't. Um, and then I embed the actual event. I have to upload it to um, YouTube. Uh, then I um, include selected comments and I activate the links we talk about. And wherever possible, uh, I insert a graphic. Like this morning, we were talking about the NGSQ study groups and also about the one in Second Life. And I, <laughs> I was overachieving this morning, Russ. Uh, I included the video that we did earlier this month on how to set up a second like avatar so that you can get to just genealogy's fire pit and attend the NGSQ study group as you wish. Talked about Evernote. I try to make it look interesting. Now <clears throat> I'm going to uh, I've already made a post regarding our first chapter where we talked about the Puritan migration. So what you're going to see, I have to update that one plus the new one with the cumulative list of the study group sessions that are part of this. So eventually it'll be one whole um, listing. Um, and that's what that's where the best place to go see everything in context. But for commenting, you'll want to go to that particular event uh, listed over on Google Plus. Google Plus is better. You get all your notices by email if you've turned on notifications, which are on by default. Um, anything else before we go, Cousin Russ? Have we about done it? I think we've got it. By George, I think we've got it. Well, I hope that you enjoyed our session this time. Uh, our next session will be um, on the 7th of February, the North Midlands to the Delaware, the Friends Migration from 1675 to 1725. And then the, uh, then we wait an entire month because of Roots Tech, uh, and we'll meet on the 7th of March, and we'll talk about the borderlands to the backcountry, the flight from North Britain from 1717 to 1775. All righty. Uh, anything else? I think we got it. I, I really do. Thank you guys for being so patient with old Mert tonight. Uh, nothing left to say, but on behalf of Cousin Russ, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Happy family tree climbing, everybody. That's a wrap. <laughs>